The scale of this latest outbreak is, as well as being depressingly predictable, a direct consequence of the conflict. And had the parties to the conflict cared, the outbreak was avoidable. You know, my grandparents immigrated from Egypt. We came here in the 70s. I was born in Egypt, but I moved here when I was two. That's why you can see I have no accent. <laughs> and as all good people of immigrant nations, we moved to the Bronx. So Hello, my name is Stanley Heller. Welcome to The Struggle. The Struggle is shown in over 30 cable stations from Vermont to New York City. On the internet at thestruggle.org. Our YouTube channel, Struggle Video Media. Today, the Saudi-U.S. cholera war against Yemen and the counter rally to the Muslim haters in Connecticut. It started last fall in Yemen in the midst of their civil war and the Saudi-U.S. war of aggression against Yemen. An outbreak of cholera, a disease where your fluids leave your body catastrophically. The bacteria is spread easily in polluted water and food and can kill in just hours. Now there are over a hundred thousand cases of cholera in Yemen. Democracy Now! reports. This is Democracy Now!, democracynow.org, The War and Peace Report. I'm Amy Goodman. And I'm Juan Gonzalez. Welcome to all of our listeners and viewers around the country and around the world. In Yemen, medical groups are warning an outbreak of cholera has infected more than 116,000 people. The World Health Organization says a waterborne illness has claimed the lives of at least 859, and Oxfam estimates cholera is claiming one life every hour in, in, in Yemen. Children under the age of 15 account for 46 percent of the cases. The WHO says the number of cases could reach 300,000, as the outbreak has now spread to 20 of Yemen. 22 provinces. Yemen's health care system is also on the verge of collapse, as many hospitals have shut down because of the ongoing U.S.-backed Saudi war. Only 45 percent of Yemen's hospitals are still operational. This is Dr. Hussein al-Haddad, the director of one of the few hospitals in Sana'a that is still functioning. The situation is very bad. The children that are suffering from cholera are countless, and there aren't enough beds. The technical know-how in the hospital is also insufficient to deal with the situation we are facing. The cholera epidemic comes amidst a U.S.-backed Saudi-led bombing campaign in Yemen, a naval blockade that's left Yemen sanitation, water and health infrastructure in shambles. The United Nations warned some 19 million of Yemen's 28 million people need some form of aid, with many of them at risk of famine. This is U.N. Emergency Relief Coordinator Stephen O'Brien addressing the United Nations Security Council late last month. Yemen now has the ignominy of being the world's largest food security crisis, with more than 17 million people who are food insecure, 6.8 million of whom are one step away from famine. Crisis is not coming. It is not even looming. It is here today, on our watch, and ordinary people are paying the price. It is important to bear in mind that malnutrition and cholera are interconnected. Weakened and hungry people are more likely to contract cholera and less able to survive it. According to estimates, 150,000 cases are projected for the next six months in addition to the broadly 60,000 current suspected cases since last April, with 500 associated deaths. The scale of this latest outbreak is, as well as being depressingly predictable, a direct consequence of the conflict. And had the parties to the conflict cared, the outbreak was avoidable. That was U.N. Emergency Relief Coordinator Stephen O'Brien addressing the U.N. Security Council last month. President Donald Trump signed a series of arms deals with Saudi Arabia, totaling a record $110 billion during a visit uh, to the Saudi capital. The arms deal includes tanks, artillery, ships, helicopters, missile defense systems, and cybersecurity technology. United Nations monitors have warned previous Saudi-led attacks on Yemen could constitute crimes against humanity. 
you, over 10,000 people have died since the Saudi bombing campaign began in 2015. For more, we go to Sana'a, Yemen, where we're joined by Anas Shahari of Save the Children, Yemen. He joins us uh, from the capital. Welcome to Democracy Now! Uh, thanks so much for joining us. Tell us the scope of the problem. Uh, the problem is uh, very massive. <clears throat> Excuse me. The problem is very massive. It's like we are facing a very uh, uh, critical situation here. Uh, a lot of people are suffering from cholera. Uh, I just uh, received uh, uh, an SMS from uh, one friend in a village uh, just before this uh, interview. He's telling me that the cholera is spreading in Hajja governorate and people are struggling to get medications. And you can imagine every day the numbers are increasing. The upsurge is very scary. Uh, we have to deal with, with all of these cases as Yemenis and humanitarian organizations are struggling to respond to the needs of those people with, with very short uh, uh, funding. Uh, you might think that this plague of cholera might give the U.S. administration pause in its total support for the Saudi killing in Yemen. But this is not to be. Trump evidently is giving the Saudis a blank check. A group of U.S. senators did try to stop a $400 million sale of precision-guided munitions to the Saudis. But Trump and his people waved the Iran flag, and the measure was narrowly defeated, 53 to 46. Actually, the Iranian government, with its many, many faults, plays a very minor role in the Yemen fighting. The Saudis are killing chiefly because of their arrogance, because of their desire to become a great power. One bit of good news is that the Democratic Party leadership for the first time supported the work of Senator Murphy in trying to rein in the Saudis. They supported this bill. This should help make opposition to Saudi Arabia mainstream. For more about this, see the side of the coalition to end the U.S.-Saudi alliance, SaudiUS.org. A footnote from a story of last week. As reported, the Gulf monarchy billionaires are in a bitter dispute among themselves. The Saudis started it taking on Qatar for supposed support of terrorism. Trump agreed with the Saudis and said the nation of Qatar is supporting terrorism at a very high level. And then a few days ago he made a deal. He sold those very same Qataris $12 billion worth of weapons. It's enough to give hypocrisy a bad name. A group hiding behind the patriotic name Act for America is spreading the idea that Muslims want to force Islam on America and make everyone obey Sharia. Last week, they had rallies in a score of U.S. cities. They were opposed. In Connecticut, the night before a Waterbury ACT rally, a mosque hosted a meeting that was well attended and even included Governor Daniel Malloy. One of the speakers was Reza Mansour, the president of the Islamic Association of Greater Hartford. He talked about Sharia. I am here to also tell you that the hate that killed people in Manchester and London, as they did, as they do in Syria, Iraq, Afghanistan, and Iran in this blessed month of Ramadan, are not the actions of Muslims. They are the actions of depraved human beings and their mass killings are without religious guidance. And I want to remind you that over 95% of the victims of ISIS's barbaric killings are in fact Muslim. To call ISIS in any way Islamic or representing Islam as some hate groups here do 
and of course ISIS does, you will often find these two groups have similar positions, is to give them respect far from what they deserve. We are here to also stand up against the bigotry that is spreading in our nation, based on hate groups that must be condemned by all of us together. And I'm overjoyed that there is there are so many of you standing with us today. The hate group Act for America that are organizing hate rallies throughout the nation tomorrow and designated by the Southern Poverty Law Center as one of the most active hate groups in America against Islam, come on, come on. spreading fear about Islam, using Islamic religious Arabic terms that they, they can then define in the most hateful way. But they don't stop there. They also attribute to Islam the worst cultural practices that were happening even before the time of Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. For example, female genital mutilation that they highlight in their videos is a practice that happens, happened in Africa before the time of the Prophet and is happening now in parts of Africa, in Christian and Muslim parts of Africa alike. To attribute this to Islam makes little sense, but this is one more fabrication that they do. In fact, Islam forbids the mutilation of the body and therefore this cultural practice happens despite Islam. But they also highlight Sharia as they call it confusion as it is an Arabic term that has spread a lot of fear because of many irresponsible news outlets that will talk to hate mongers, especially from ACT themselves, often as well as politicians that thrive on the politics of fear even winning the highest officers doing so. Let me explain to you briefly what Sharia really means because the education is vitally important. Sharia literally means the path. And before Islam, it was understood to be the path to the watering hole where shepherds quench their thirst and their sheep. After Islam, it took on a religious meaning as the path to success and salvation and is very similar in meaning to Halakhic law, Jewish law, which literally means the path in Hebrew. It's nothing so different. Sharia, however, is not law. They are the guidelines upon which Muslims live our lives. The guidance comes from our two sources of guidance, the Quran, the divine word of God through Archangel Gabriel to Prophet Muhammad, God's peace be with him, and the teachings and narrations of Prophet Muhammad that are the hadith. It guides to living a moral and ethical life, whether that is as a business person, as a physician, or any other human being. It also includes our beliefs and practices, including prayer, giving in charity, and fasting as we are in this month, the holy month of Ramadan. Scholars in Islam came up with principles of Sharia and please compare these with the Constitution and Bill of Rights as I go through them. The first is the protection of the right and sanctity of life. The right to protect one's family. The right to protect one's property. The right to education for all, including women despite some cultural practices in parts of the world. The right to freedom to practice your religion the way you want. And the right to protect your identity as a human being. Just to give you an idea of the use of this in modern times, as there were no ventilators at the time of the Prophet, we use these principles in medical ethics to come up with guidelines to help the sickest people with end-of-life related issues using the sanctity of life and the dignity of the human being. The result is a document very similar to how we practice as physicians in the United States. Understand that 10% of America's physicians are Muslim and we are 1% of the population. We are deeply involved in healing, 
in America, which is based on the Quran's encouragement that the saving of a life is as though you saved all of humanity. That is the source of guidance. That is Sharia. The next day, ACT demonstrated in the Connecticut city of Waterbury and scores demonstrated against them. The United Nations Population Fund estimates that 5,000 women are killed each year worldwide for dishonoring their... No hate, no fear. Muslims are welcome here, no hate, no fear. Muslims are welcome here, no hate, no fear. Muslims are welcome here, no fear, no hate. No fear. Muslims are welcome here. 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 No hate. No fear. I came from New Haven because I saw on Facebook that there was a uh, counter protest to uh, what apparently is a very small uh, group of people who don't see the world the way that we do. Um, you know, listen, uh, language matters, right? Language has brought us to this point, I think. I think uh, some of the things that we've heard in the last two or three years from those who are running to be the leaders of our country uh, have something to do with why people are emboldened to be out today uh, to say what those people down there are saying. But when you look at the two different groups, I think you see a more diverse group over here. I think you see a bigger group, and that's because uh, it's hard to be one of those people. When our Jewish brothers and sisters were killed in the Holocaust, we said never again. Yet here we are today. Standing on the same side, on the same street with a group that preaches hate, that preaches to divide us, that is preaching for hate from the top all the way down. So we're here to remind this group, this administration, these senators, these representatives, our president, our so-called president, that never again is today, that never again is never again, whether it be Muslim, Christian, Jewish, atheist, anyone. That we will not let anyone divide us that we will let this hate drive out, that our peace, our love, and our unity will be here. We will be standing next to each other, as Bishop just said. They come to divide us, we come to unite us. They come to peddle hate, we come to peddle love. America, you know better. If we are truly want to fight radicalism and extremism, then this is what we need to do. We need to put our hands together. We need to be united. We cannot face this problem divided. We cannot be shouting across the fences at each other, but we need to be working hand in hand with each other. My dear brothers and sisters, don't get fooled by their title. Don't get fooled by what they are telling you they're here for. They are supposedly against Sharia and they're marching against them because it's taking over America. <laughs> but what we, what, what they're here for is to put on an extreme agenda. The ironic thing is, that every time I talk about ISIS, every time I talk about Act for America, I find myself using the same talking points. <laughs> they are opposed, supposedly, to Sharia law, but in fact, they are opposed to see Muslims assimilated, to see Muslims part of the American fabric. And what does ISIS want to peddle? They want Muslims to not be assimilated. They want Muslims to look at others as infidels. And they want us to act heinous crimes. Well, that's what they survive on. And here's the problem. 
Act for America has been in existence for probably 15 years. But now, Act for America has access to the White House. Because the person who's sitting in the White House is welcoming them with open arms. And we need to say no to that. We need to organize, we need to push back, and we need to take the White House back from its free business and back to the people. For my dear brothers and sisters, the fight is long, it is hard, and it needs work, and it needs dedication, it needs for us to organize, it needs for us to reach out to each other, and it needs us to stand together and fund the work that each and every one do. There is great organizations. I'm looking around and I see great faces, great organizations. Thank you. Please do not leave today until you meet somebody new. Please do not leave today before you get on into an organized group and be part of them. You know, my grandparents immigrated from Egypt. We came here in the 70s. I was born in Egypt, but I moved here when I was two. That's why you can see I have no accent. <laughs> and as all good people of immigrant nations, we moved to the Bronx. That's where we all start, right? <laughs> and as we moved to the Bronx, like I said, we started off just like anybody because we wanted to pursue the American dream. The American dream is not just for one community. The American dream is for all communities. When I look at the U.S. of A, I see everybody of all different faiths, different backgrounds, different skin color, different beliefs, different way to love one another. And when I see that, that is what makes this country great. Love does not make, love is what's needed in this country. Hate does not make this country great. Hate crimes, uh, last year, 44% rose in the Muslim community. 44% of hate crimes rose in the Muslim community. Over 70% of Islamophobic acts happened. Now it's unfortunate what happened in Portland um, with the, the, the folks who have passed away, but I wear this every day. I identify in the public as a Muslim. Every day I'm wondering, you know, am I gonna walk and I'm gonna encounter this person who's gonna come and like say something offensive or rip, rip uh, you know, my headscarf off, my jeb off. I get worried. But when I see beautiful people like you here today standing with me, I have some hope in our America. Yes. I have some hope in our America. You see, when God stood down on the face of the earth and made man, he made all of us. No matter what faith he belonged to, I've been a Christian ever since I knew myself. But my Muslim faith believers are my brothers and sisters. They are our neighbors. The man asked Jesus, who is my neighbor? And see, Jesus implied that no matter how far out of the neighborhood you may live, because of his need, you have become his neighbor. I can't watch my Muslim brother or sister in need like they do now because apparently from the top, the seed of hate is being sowed. I have to stand next to him. I have to come over here and stop and stand next to him. I've got to put my arms, I've got to do more than that. I've got to put my arms around him and I've got to whisper to him that I love you. I want to see you succeed. I want to see your children succeed. I want to see your children grow up in a place that called the United States of America. What do we believe in the word United? My God, what do we believe in the word United? United. We stand. When 9-11 happened, every time I look around, I see the world. We are united. We are united. But every day, every day, my brothers and sisters, whether they're in school or in, or in their mosque, they are being persecuted. Where does the united stand?
Divide it. Where does it stop? It never stops. I served six years in the U.S. Navy so that they could do that and you could do this. Right. I, did, I didn't prepare any remarks. I was moved to come up here and say this. I was stationed in Morocco and I had many, many dear friends who were Muslim. And I learned about Islam, and I learned that they, they honor guests in their home. There are so many wonderful, wonderful Muslim customs that I dearly love my friends, who I still are in touch with in Morocco. And that's what brought me out here today. I saw that this, that, that was going on, and I came here. So, in a, from a different religion, the Buddha said, you fear what you don't understand. And as my sister in the yellow shirt said, learn about Islam if you are not. Because when you learn about Islam, you will not fear Islam. Before I go on a report about another disgraceful development, Palestinian Authority boss Mahmoud Abbas is telling the Israelis to cut back electricity into Gaza by 40 percent. The PA is having a dispute with Hamas. Now Gaza already has very little electricity, a 40 percent cut. You can imagine what this would do to food and medicine during the hot months in Palestine. Israeli writer Gideon Levy speculates that this may, might cause violence coming out of Gaza against Israel and with the expected retaliation of a new Israeli massacre against Gaza Palestinians. We link to his powerful article at thestruggle.org. That's our program for today. See you next week at this time. I'm Stanley Heller, and this has been The Struggle.